Legos have always fascinated me. These prismatic building blocks were the gateway to expressing my creativity, and most likely yours too. Over a trillion of these blocks have been made over the past 60 years. People not only play with these blocks, but the blocks themselves play an important role in shaping interests, such as mine. They had a part in me becoming a chemist. Legos have a lot in common with chemistry. You can build with molecules the same way you can build with blocks and create new things. And just as blocks can connect in specific ways and not others, so can molecules. Besides these similarities, Legos are a marvel of not only engineering, but chemistry. Legos are made from plastic, specifically ABS. This is a plastic polymer composed of three distinct monomers, acryl nitrile, butadiene, and styrene. These chemicals combine to create a robust material with excellent resistance, durability, and machining properties. ABS is ideal for manufacturing of precise and colorful Lego bricks. The intriguing challenge arises when we attempt to revert this plastic back to its original chemical components. Most recycling processes are mechanical, where the plastic is shredded then reformed into new products. However, chemical recycling is far more complex endeavor. Ideally, we would like to break down the polymer back directly into its monomers, essentially reversing the chemical bonds that form ABS. The problem is the very properties that make this plastic so useful, its stability and durability, also make this process incredibly challenging. ABS is a very stable polymer, resistant to breakdown under normal conditions. However, we can overcome this stability through a process known as thermal depolymerization. By applying significant heat, we can break down the chemical bonds within the polymer, effectively decomposing it back into its constituent monomers. Let's see if we can break down ABS into its components. Mainly, I want to focus on getting out styrene due to its use in many other chemical synthesis. So, how do we go about doing this? First, the Lego bricks were loaded into a round bottom flask. Normally, you wouldn't want to fill a flask past its halfway point, but since Legos are mostly air, they'll shrink down significantly as they melt. The flask was then connected up to a simple distillation setup. A heating mantle was used to supply the necessary heat, which needs to reach about 500 degrees Celsius. Although we could proceed with the reaction in this configuration, high temperatures in an oxygen-rich environment can cause problems through thermal oxidization of the chemicals, leading to numerous byproducts. To minimize this, we add an adapter with a gas inlet. We can then purge the system with nitrogen. This displacement of air results in fewer side products through oxidation. The chemicals won't react all that well with an inert gas like nitrogen. After purging the system with nitrogen, we began to heat the flask slowly, starting at a low temperature and gradually ramping it up. Around 100 degrees Celsius, we started to see water evaporating and collecting at the top of the flask. When the temperature reached around 250 degrees Celsius, the ABS plastic began to melt, and at around 500 degrees Celsius, the plastic began to break down. As breakdown occurred, liquids started to boil off and climb up the flask, eventually reaching the condenser and running down into the collection flask. This process of breaking down the plastic is slow and requires continuous heat to extract significant amount of material. I allowed the distillation to run for about 10 hours until no more material started distilling over. There was still liquid left in the flask, but if it doesn't distill at 500 degrees Celsius, it's most likely large components of polymer fragments that are not desirable for our purposes. I did a test batch of the Legos previously, and it was interesting to see the amount of distillate that I got out previously was much more than I got out this time. It's interesting to see the variation between experiments. I would love to analyze the distillate products as they are, but the analysis method I want to use has temperature limitations to it. I can only analyze compounds with boiling points below that of 280 degrees Celsius. To work within these constraints, we can perform another distillation, keeping the temperatures below 280 degrees Celsius, since high temperatures are no longer needed to break down the plastics. However, there's another challenge. Both styrene and acryl nitrile has similar boiling points. Since my primary goal is to see if we can extract styrene from the Legos, we need to remove the acryl nitrile. Styrene is not water soluble, but acryl nitrile is. By transferring the distillate to a separatory funnel, then washing the distillate with water, 
We can remove the acryl nitrile and any other water soluble impurities. Our nonpolar styrene is immiscible with water and will just float on the surface. We can wash it several times to ensure that it is clean, performing a series of shakes, vents, and repeat cycles. Once the washing is complete, the organic layer, now hopefully mostly styrene and other nonpolar compounds, is collected into a flask. We can perform another distillation. The new problem is that we have a mix of compounds here. A simple distillation will not work. Just a mix of stuff will come over and this is where fractional distillation comes in. The fractional distillation setup is quite similar to that of regular distillation, with a key difference being the inclusion of a fractional column. There are many types of fractional columns, such as bubbler plates, packed columns, etc. Today we'll use a Vigroup column. The Vigroup column allows for better separation of mixtures by providing a place for the vapor to condense resulting in a more efficient distillation process. Only substances that boil at the current temperature of the column will make it over to the collection vessel, while higher boiling point compounds will condense and run back into the boiling flask. By starting with the tall regroup column, we can gradually reduce its height as we separate the lower boiling point chemicals. This approach should help us achieve a pure distillate. Once the column warmed up, liquid started to come over. I kept the heat high until no more material came over the column. The columns have a limitation to them. We can only supply so much heat to the distillation and to the column until it cools off in the air, leading to no more material making it over. This made it so I had to switch out the column for a shorter length column to allow me to supply enough heat to warm up the column before it cooled off in the air so that material could then come over. When I switched out the column, I also switched out the receiving flask, and once the column warmed back up, material started to work its way over. It still had below the boiling point of styrene, but the temperature slowly increased until it reached 145 degrees Celsius. At that point, I switched out the flask once again and collected the distillate. Hopefully this distillate is mostly styrene, though it may contain impurities. I continued to collect the distillate until the temperature climbed past 140 degrees Celsius. I then switched out the flask once again and continued to collect the distillate until no more was coming over. By carefully controlling the temperature and managing the distillation process with a fractional column, we aim to achieve the separation and purification of our desired compounds, particularly styrene from the mixture. Though this is quite difficult with a complex mix such as what we have. Here's our collection of final distillates. Now, we need to determine which chemicals are present in each sample. Normally, we might use a basic instrument such as an FTIR or NMR for identification, but these are best for analyzing individual molecules, such as those that we obtain from chemical synthesis. However, today's experiment yielded a mixture of chemicals, and we need to identify all of them. This leaves us with two main options, high-performance liquid chromatography and gas chromatography mass spec. Unfortunately, our HPLC system is down and is currently non-functional, leaving us with GC mass spec as our primary tool. And GC mass spec is just way better. I prepared four GC vials, labeled them according to the order in which the distillates were collected. I took a small sample from each collection flask and placed it into the vial. It only takes a very small amount for a sample to be analyzed. If you can see the analyte, you have enough. Now we need something to dissolve it in and carry it through the column. For the carrier solvent, I chose ether due to its volatility and its excellent ability to dissolve the chemicals that we have here. Ether is somewhat tricky to handle because of its high volatility. It can shoot out of the pipette if not handled quickly and carefully. The samples were then loaded into the GCMS spec. To avoid measuring the solvent, we set the initial temperature to 30 degrees Celsius 
and held it there for two minutes, allowing all the ether to evaporate before the mass spectrometer began collecting data. If we start collecting data, all that ether will hit the detector, leading it to degrading faster and may even break it. Then we ramp up the temperature to around 250 degrees Celsius, at a climb rate of 20 degrees Celsius per minute. Between these two temperatures, the compounds that we produced in the distillate should elute from the column. Each sample takes approximately 30 minutes to run, so after two hours we had complete the analysis for all four samples. The GC mass spec outputs data as both a retention time chart and a mass spectra from fragments. From here we have two options, manually search for each mass number using an online database or let the computer perform the analysis using a similarity search tool. The similarity search tool compares the detected mass fragments against known samples in a library database, giving a percent likelihood of the match. We consider matches with a high similarity, higher than 90%, to be reliable, while those below 80% are likely not accurate matches and probably not the molecule that we're detecting. Using this tool, I analyzed the data from our four collections identifying the chemical components based on their retention time and mass spectra. This method provides us with detailed composition of each distillate, allowing us to understand the results of our thermal depolymerization process and the effectiveness of our separation technique, showing what percent of each compound makes up each distillate. The first distillate is made up of a bunch of low boiling point molecules, such as toluene. There are probably many more that were present, but also boil off alongside the ether. With the second distillate, we have less of those low boiling materials, and moving into the higher boiling point ones, as the distillation column continues to warm up. This is where we start seeing styrene start to come over. The third distillate is composed of four main products, with trace amounts of toluene still present. This residual toluene could just be due to a couple factors. Some of it may have been still left in the condenser, or it could be part of an azeotrope formed during distillation process. An azeotrope is a mixture of two or more substances that have a constant boiling point and composition through the distillation process. This occurs because vapor has the same composition as the liquid mixture, making it difficult to separate the components by simple distillation. A classic example of azeotropic mixtures are ethanol and water. When distilling a mixture of ethanol and water, you encounter an azeotrope at approximately 95.6% ethanol and 4.4% water, which boils at 78.1 degrees Celsius. This means that no matter how carefully you distill the mixture, you cannot achieve a higher purity than 95.6% ethanol using a standard distillation technique. The azeotropic composition of ethanol and water boil at a lower point than either of the pure compounds by themselves making it impossible to separate them completely through simple distillation. In our case, with the third distillate, the close boiling points of the compound suggest that a more careful fractional distillation might help to achieve a better separation. However, if there is a formation of an azeotrope, this could complicate the process. If the components in our distillate form that azeotrope, they will boil all together at a constant composition mixture, just like ethanol and water. The fourth distillate is made up of four main components again, with the absence of any toluene. We also start to see some higher boiling point compounds come over, such as N-butylbenzene. A really cool principle that you can see here is as the molecule's molecular weight increases, so does its temperature. You can see as the benzene ring builds off of itself into more complicated styrene components, it gets heavier and increases molecular weight and increases boiling point. Overall, I was able to get styrene out of Legos, though it was not as pure as I would like it to be, but nonetheless, it was a fun project. If you have any comments or questions, post those in the comments section below. Thank you for our channel sponsors, and thank you for watching the video.